I don't know if you know this, but one of the requirements of being a pastor is that you've got to love drinking coffee. Um, it's not in the Bible, um, but it's just the unwritten rule of ministry. It's prayer, it's Bible reading, it's sermon prep, it's drinking coffee. Um, um, some days, based on how many meetings I have, uh, my coffee intake can be actually pretty dangerous. Um, and, but the real, for me, I need coffee in the morning. Um, now, there are times where I will drive to a, um, a Black Rock coffee. I can't drink Starbucks. I'm sorry for you guys that love Starbucks. But um, uh, Black Rock coffee or some neighborhood coffee shop, and I will, maybe it's a Dunkin' Donuts. Dunkin' Donuts is so much better than Starbucks. Um, but, um, and grab a cup of coffee, and I will get it, and the person will give it to me. I will put it in the cup holder, and then I will end up on a phone call or something, and I will drive to wherever I'm going, and I'll be on a phone call, and then I'll, sometimes I'm just driving here, and I'll get busy in the moment and get things, um, things going or meeting with someone to the point that by the time I finally drink my coffee, it's, it's not even cold. It'd be one thing if it was cold. It's, it's just lukewarm. It lacks its luster. It's, um, it doesn't taste good anymore. And I don't need my coffee scorching hot. I know some of you guys do where you don't want to feel your tongue for like days afterward. That's not me. And when it gets lukewarm, um, my tendency often is not to finish that cup because it's lost its value. It's lost why I bought it. And I might as well just have spent that money on gas station coffee. Um, and it's interesting because that can happen to us as Christians. In fact, it happened to the church in Laodicea where this church, they became casual and safe in their faith. And Jesus ends up calling them out on it. So if you have your Bibles, we're in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, Revelation 3. And we're going to be in verses 14 down to verse 22. Over the last seven weeks, this is week 8, we have been going through these letters in the book of Revelation, letters ooh, um, that Jesus had written through the Apostle John to, um, to the um, local churches in the area. And in those letters, he would begin with these, he would tell them, man, these are the things that you're doing that, man, I'm so proud of. You are engaging in these things that makes me as your Savior so happy. You, I look at these things that you do, and it, it brings me joy. Keep doing it. But then often in those letters, he would also give a, common, uh, a rebuke. He'd say, but there are these things that you do. There are some things that you do that, man, it breaks me. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart to the point that I've got to write to you about this because if you don't change course, you will actually end up destroying yourself. And I think the letters in Revelation, while they were written specifically for churches in um, ancient Turkey, they have so much truth for us here in 2021 at Lost City. Because the danger is we can easily go through the motions of Christianity. We can easily go through um, the things that we're supposed to do. And in that, our hearts have drifted far from Jesus. And we can, like in many of the churches, they, Jesus commends them for so much good that they're doing. But he says some of these negative things ultimately causes you harm and danger. And it's amazing that 2,000 years later, we still struggle with the same things. Now, the, it looks a little different in the modern world, but when we get to the core of the issue, not a lot has changed over time. And you're going to find out that this is going to be true that of the church that Jesus speaks to in the church in Laodicea. Look at me, Revelation 3, verses 14. Revelation 3, 14, here's what it says. It says, write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. He says, thus says the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the originator of God's creation. Write to the church of Laodicea, thus says the amen. And if you remember, all of Jesus' letters have this um, similar format. It begins by Jesus introducing himself. He says, this is who I am. 
And every letter has a different introduction based on what that church needed to hear. Every church had a different um, commendation of things, man, these are things that you're doing well. Every church had a different rebuke. Every church had a different, hey, this is what you need to do. And, uh, um, this, and every church had a different reward that was promised to him. But it's interesting here, he uses these words. He says that these are the words of the amen, the amen. Now, if you grew up in church or if you've been in church for a while, that word amen has a, is a common word for you. Like when we sing, um, you will often say amen. When we hear um, something in the word that's being preached that you're like, man, that was good, you'll say amen. At the end of a prayer, you'll say amen. For, but for most of us, outside of religion, outside of Christianity, amen is not a common word that we use. In church, you'll hear this often, but you're not hearing this word often said in your job or in your parenting or wherever you are in life. And the definition of that word is really simple. It basically means, let it be so. Let it be so. And so when someone says amen, what they're saying is, let, it, let that be true in my life. Right? And so when you hear a sermon and it's like some point resonates with you, whether you realize it or not, when you say amen, what you're saying is, let that be true in my life. Let it be so in my life. And so what's interesting here is that Jesus introduces himself as the amen. The amen. That let me be true in your life. Now, this is a church word for us today. But in the first century, this word was a legal word. It was a word that you found at the end of legal documents that made the contract binding. So they would write out the contract, and at the end of the contract, they would just put the word amen, and it meant whatever was written in this contract, let it be so. Whatever was written here, we're going to hold ourselves true to that. And here's Jesus introducing himself as the amen. What he's saying is, I am the faithful God. I am consistent. I do not change. And Jesus says, if it's going to be, it will happen. Let it be so. I am. Amen. In fact, the next two words that he uses, he says, the faithful and the true witness, the originator of God's creation. This is how he introduces himself to this church, that I am faithful. And what you're going to discover in this letter is this church has become unfaithful. And Jesus basically is reminding us, hey, even when you've been unfaithful, I continue to be faithful. I continue to be true and faithful to you. And then he continues there in verse 15. He says these words. He says, I know your works. You're neither hot nor cold. I'm going to, and because of that, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Right? And because you're lukewarm, because you're neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. And when you read that, Jesus doesn't beat around the bush here. Right? There is some, there is some frustration that Jesus is expressing here. You know, I, I, some of us, um, we grew up in churches that were very legalistic. And so um, we've drifted to the other side of the spectrum where we're just like, Man, it's about grace. God doesn't really require a lot of us. It's not about what we do. And we shifted so far to the pendulum that there is no call to live lives for Jesus anymore. It's about, hey, just love Jesus. Just do this. But friends, if this letter to Revelation is a description of what Jesus expects for us, there are things that faith produces actions. Right? We don't do things to earn God's favor, but our faith in Jesus produces a lifestyle that makes us completely different. And so Jesus in this church, he gets right to it. He jumps right into this seriousness of their issue. And you see how serious he is. The words that he used. If you remember, most of the churches, Jesus acknowledged some of the good things they did. And before he offered a word of retreat, a critique, he, was, he uses modern day communication principles, right? Hey, before you tell someone bad, Tell them something good so they can linger on the good for a second and then tell them what they're doing wrong. And that's what Jesus does here. But Laodicea and Sardis were two churches that received zero words of commendation from Jesus. Jesus is pretty upset with this church. And friends, that ought to cause us to stop and say, what was this church doing wrong 
that we need to be mindful of. What was this church doing in their behaviors, in their lifestyle, in their patterns that if we're not careful, we could replicate, and one day Jesus will look at us and say, man, I see all that you have, but you missed it. You didn't get it. And Jesus gets right to the problem, and he says, you're neither hot nor you're cold, and because you're lukewarm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Vomit you. That doesn't sound like the Jesus we want to follow. It doesn't sound like a pretty Jesus. Jesus is saying, where you are right now, man, it actually makes me sick. It makes me disgusted to the point that I just want to throw you up. That's hard. Those are hard, hard words. And listen, we have confused this verse a lot. He says, you're neither hot nor cold. And a lot of us read this passage, and we often interpret this passage incorrectly. We read this passage, and we assume that Jesus wants us to be on fire for Jesus, right? Or, you know what, if you're not going to be on fire, just be cold. Just don't care about me. Um, I don't think Jesus wants anyone to be cold for Jesus. That's not what he's communicating there. We think a person that's hot is someone who's on fire for Jesus and will do anything that Jesus wants them to do. And when we read this and we assume that Jesus wants us to pick one or the other, either be on fire for Jesus or, you know what, just don't give me any mind at all. We think that God wants us to pick sides. But we've got to recognize as we study the context to this letter, where this letter was written, that hot and cold in this passage are the exact same thing. They're both good things. They're both things that the people of Laodicea desired. It's the value of hot water and the value of cold water. They're both valuable to the city of Laodicea. In fact, what Jesus is doing here is he's speaking directly into the circumstances of that city. And if you don't understand the context, you will misinterpret what and think that Jesus said something that he never said. See, this was a city that everyone wanted to live in. This was a booming city. They were wealthy. They had beautiful buildings. They had a medical center that was better than most other medical centers in the region. They had all sorts of amenities for a good city. In fact, outside of Ephesus, this was a city where everybody wanted to live in, but they had one major problem. The city's major liability was they had no drinking water. They had no water to drink. The city of Heropolis, which is about seven miles away, was known for all of the hot springs. People would go there for vacation, and they would enjoy the hot springs of the area. And then 11 miles away, there was a city called Colossae, to which the uh, Colossians was written. And that city was known for its cold springs, cold water. And because Laodicea didn't have hot water or cold water, they built aqueducts. And these aqueducts would bring water in from one of these other areas. And so the water would begin in... You want to go. The future is bright. And so you bank and you trust in your education because you know that if you just do things right, things will be good for you. Maybe it's your 401k or your stock that you're investing in. Maybe it's for your retirement. You think that if things keep going the way it's going, then, man, I can't wait till retirement where I'm going to enjoy life. And you bank and you trust in that. Maybe it's a relationship, it's a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a husband or a wife or a child that you say, as long as this person is in my life, then I've got everything I need. I don't need you, Jesus. I don't need you there. See, what happened in the church in Laodicea is that they depended on their money. And friends, when we depend on something other than God, it leads us to a place where we say, God, I don't need you. God, we don't really need you. Now, let's be honest, we will never say that with our mouths. We would never look at God and say, God, I don't need you. But the truth is, we live that way. We live that way. We live in a way that basically says that as long as I have my finances in order, God, I'll put you in that corner in case of an emergency, but I got this. And if something bad happens, then I'll make sure I pull you out of the corner and you're, you're back in my life. But... As long as things are going well, you know what, God? You don't need to tell me how I live or what I do or what I do with my finances or what my relationships look like. Life is good. You stay 
in that corner. I'll call you when I need you. And this is what Jesus says in verse 17. Look at that verse again. He says, I'm rich. You say, I'm rich. I become wealthy. And I need nothing. Laodicea was so wealthy. That in fact, they became, they were able to proudly proclaim their independence, financial independence, even from Rome. In fact, in AD 60, there was a major earthquake that destroyed this entire city. And what would happen in that day, just like it happens in our day, when a natural disaster happens, the federal government would come in and give aid to rebuild. And so when this earthquake happened, Rome said, the emperor came in and said, hey, we'll help you rebuild. And Laodicea was so wealthy that they told Rome, you know what? We don't need it. We're good. We don't need your help. We are good. After a natural disaster, they were financially stable enough to pick up and rebuild. And they basically told Rome, we don't need your help. We can handle this on our own. And the church in Laodicea did the exact same thing with God. We've got our money, God. We have all that we need. We can, you can stay back there on speed dial, but really at the end of the day, we don't need you. We've got this figured out. Let me be honest because this is a trap that a lot of us can fall into because we often depend on something other than God on a regular basis. You know, we've been, as a church, working through the core values of our church and narrowed them down from the 10 that are out there to a simple four phrases. The first one there is Christ-centered. We want to be Christ-centered. We want to be all about Jesus. But how this plays out, I was sharing this at our worship team meeting yesterday, is that whether you are singing or playing an instrument or on the um, things back there or you're preaching, that what this means for us who serve, who volunteer, who are part of this church, what this means is we're dependent. Why? Why? Because Christ is the source of all that we are and all that we do. When we say we're Christ-centered, it means we've got to be absolutely dependent on Jesus. Friends, when I lead this church out of an overconfidence in myself and my skills and my abilities and my talents and my ability to read God's word and interpret that God's word, I am basically communicating to Jesus, hey, Jesus, I got this. I don't need you. I can do this by myself. I can lead this church on my own. Yes, you're there on speed dial because when, I get, um, when things go bad and people get angry, that's when I need you. But when things are good, I got this. Our programs are set. Our agenda is set. Our vision is set. And Jesus, you just, in fact, you, how about this? You just bless it. You just make it good. Make us get what we want. But you don't need to tell us what to do. And friends, if I get to that place where I'm leading the church out of my own power and ability, that's a warning sign for us to pack up and shut this place down. Because if the warning to Laodicea is true, back then it's going to be true for us today. When we live our lives without depending on Jesus, what happens is that we fail to realize that everything we have and all that we are is solely dependent on Jesus. It's completely from him. Do you recognize today that your job or your education or your money or your marriage or your children or your business or whatever you have, your car, your home, the bed that you sleep in, they are all gifts from God. All of it is a gift from God. And there are some of you here today, and you might be even here in this building or watching online, and you're not sure how important God is in your life, if at all. You're questioning, does God play a relevant role in your life? You're not sure if you believe in God, and I'm glad that you're here, but I want you to humbly consider something as a follower of Jesus, that just because you don't believe in God doesn't mean that you're not dependent on God. Because the very breath that you breathe is a gift from God. The very fact that you have the ability to walk in and out of this building, friends, is a gift from God. The fact that you could turn on that screen and watch the service and be able to participate this morning is a gift from God. When we depend on something other than God, we fail to realize that he is the source of all that we are and all that we have. In fact, listen to these words in John chapter 15, verse 5. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit. And listen to these words, because you can do nothing 
without me. You can do nothing without me. Some of your translation says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Friends, that will shatter your ego. That will break down your pride. I won't speak for you, but I will speak for me because there's something inside of me. When I read John 15, 5, I'm like, really, God? Like, really, I can't do anything apart from you? Let me show you all the things I could do apart from you, right? My pride and my ego says, let me show you how much I can do without your help. Now, listen, I'm being real. I know you guys never struggle through that, but I fail to realize that the only reason I'm standing today, the only reason I'm breathing, the only reason I have a home to go to is because God has been gracious to me. He's the source of everything that we have. And when we are, friends, if when we are dependent on ourselves, we set ourselves up for spiritual failure. We set ourselves up for spiritual failure. When we trust in something other than Jesus, it puts us in the place where the enemy will whisper lies in your head that causes you to believe that, hey, you don't need Jesus. Where was Jesus when life was hard? Where was Jesus when things were going rough? And we think, oh, I don't need Jesus. I can do this on my own. Jesus didn't help when I needed him, so why do I need him now? And so then we become like Laodicea. We become lukewarm. Isn't it fascinating when things are in your life are good and things are safe and things are easy and things are comfortable? We live in this reality where we don't depend on God. We got it. And that's probably true for a lot of us this morning. But the moment that something bad happens, it's almost like a reality shake. It's almost like a God reminder that God says, hey, um, you actually do need me. You thought you didn't need me, but... How are you going to fix this on your own? When things go bad and something devastating happens in your life, it's like God reminding us, hey, you can't do this without me. And I think we forget that. And Jesus continues in verse 17. He says these words in verse 17. He says, and you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. That's hard. And here's, here's the thing that caught me as I was preparing this sermon this week. When the church in Laodicea heard that, I wonder if they almost laughed at that statement. I wonder if they thought, uh, John, you sent this letter to us. That should have gone somewhere else. Because look at us. We've got money. We've got wealth. We've got clothes. We're not, we've got status. We're not wretched. We're not pitiful. We're not poor. We're not blind. We're not naked. Hey, messenger boy, you screwed up. This should have gone somewhere else. There is no way we're poor, Jesus. This doesn't apply to us. You see, the scariest part about this entire scenario is when Jesus called them out on this, they probably didn't see it. They couldn't see their own spiritual condition. And friends, that scares me half to death because I never want to get to a place in my life where I think I'm doing all the right things for God and then God looks at me and says, ah, you are missing it. You didn't get it. I never want to get to a place in my life where I think I'm blessed by God and he's showing me all this favor and I stand before him and he says, ah, you were actually poor, wretched, pitiful, blind, naked. Man, God, help us to see ourselves the way that he sees us. Because here's, here's what's different about Laodicea than all the other churches. Because external eyes looking in to this church, this church had a good. They weren't struggling. They had their wealth. They had all the programs the church members wanted. They had a huge staff. They had big buildings. They probably had multi-campus services. They were engaged in their city. They looked really, really good. But the moment you step behind the facade and the external and you got it in, you realized they were blind and naked and lukewarm. How many of us 
live in this reality where we think, God's doing amazing things for me. God is blessing me. God is providing for me. And God's actually like, no, I'm not. Because here's what I don't want you to miss. Blessings can actually blind us from the truth. Blessings can actually blind us from the truth. Sometimes we view the blessings of this world, the finances, the health, the safety, the comfort, that we can have all of those things that we think, man, God, you are just blessing me. You are just providing for me. You are just good to me. And what it does is actually blinds us from the reality that we are spiritually bankrupt. Because, friends, I have been to places in the world where they had nothing. But their love for Jesus was so much more real than I have seen in a lot of our churches, even in Lost City. And what Jesus does here in verse 18 is he transitions. And he says, the problem you have is you have half-hearted faith. You're lukewarm. And you've gotten this way because you're dependent on something else. And in verse 18, he says, this is how you change this. He says, verse 18, I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed and your, sh- and your shameful nakedness not be exposed, and ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. And so here Jesus shifts and he gives them advice and he says, this is how you change from being lukewarm to um, something that's of value to me. And he uses three unique ways. Um, And like we've seen in other letters, Jesus is directly speaking into their context. He directly speaks three things to a city. First of all, he says, buy gold from me. He's saying, listen, you're a wealthy city. You're a banking city. You have all this money. You have all this wealth. You have all this gold. But your gold will not satisfy the way that my gold will satisfy. My gold will make you rich in ways that you think you're rich. In ways when you actually think you're rich, my gold will actually make you really rich. And then he says, I want you to wear white clothes. White is, where, is referring to his righteousness. He's saying, I want you to put on me. Put on my righteousness. And what's interesting about wearing white clothes in Laodicea, they were known for their cloth. In fact, really, 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 really rich people would travel miles and miles to Laodicea to buy clothing from the city because Laodicea was known for their purple and black cloth. The reason was, The water in Laodicea, the bad water, was full of minerals. People couldn't drink it, but sheep would drink it. And pretty soon, the wool of the sheep would turn into this purple color or black color, and they would take it and use that wool and create purple clothing that royalty would want. And soon, people would come from distance, from far distances at their clothes from the city. And Jesus says, listen, you think you've got some of the best clothes in the world. You think you're the Milan of the ancient world, but listen, you don't compare to me at all. They don't even come close to what I'm offering you. And third, he says, I'm going to put ointment on your eyes. Again, Jesus speaks to the reality of their situation because Laodicea was known for its medical center, an area where they trained people in the medicine field. And in fact, in that city was a doctor who created an eye ointment, invented an eye ointment that people who were struggling with their vision would come to this doctor and come to this medical center and get treatment that would create healing in their eyes. And Jesus says, hey, you're a city that's known for your medical center, for healing that you do through your medical center, and where you're known for being inventive. But it says, listen, I know you have the ointment for um, your eyes, but I have ointment so that you could really, really see. And he's saying, would you come to me for healing? In other words, you think you have all the remedies, you think you have all the answers, you think you can help people in their situations, but you can get an ointment from me so that you can really see what really matters. And in a developed and prosperous location, like they are to see it, Jesus says, you missed it. In a developed and modern community that had all of the amenities that they needed, Jesus said, you missed me. You can't see that you've allowed your dependence on yourself to cause you to become casual and lukewarm in your relationship with me. You are blinded to your spiritual drift. And what Jesus is saying to this church and what Jesus is saying to us is, what God offers you is so much more valuable than what we can earn on our own. Friends, what God offers us is so much more valuable than what we could earn on our own. I wonder, do we really believe that? Do we really believe that? Because sometimes in life, it feels like what the world is offering is so much more appealing than what God is offering or what God wants to give me. But what God is offering is so much more valuable than anything that's offered by the world. 
And in fact, he winds down in verses 19 and 20. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and I discipline. And so be zealous and repent. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in with him and eat with him and he with me. And here in the midst of this rebuke is Jesus' word of encouragement to this church. He says, hey, you've, got, you've drifted off, but I love you. Even though you're lukewarm, I love you. And because I love you, I will rebuke you and discipline you. It's like the moment, like a parent, you look at your child and says, hey, this is actually going to lead to destruction. And because I love you, I'm going to discipline you. And Jesus says this word that we are so familiar with, but we take for granted. He says, repent. Repent. Walk away from the lifestyle you're choosing. There's a different path for you. Ultimately, Jesus was asking this church and our church this question. He's basically saying, has your faith become lukewarm? Has it become easy? Has it become comfortable? Has it become casual? Do you just go to church every Sunday and you just go through the motions and you just check off the box saying, I did my religious duty and that's the extent of your walk with Jesus? Has your got, faith gotten to the place where you no longer stretch yourself, where you no longer take risks for the gospel, that you're more concerned about being safe and comfortable? Friends, can I encourage you? Jesus never called us to a life of comfort. I know that might be shocking to some of you. You think, oh, I'll come to Jesus and he'll just bless me and give me everything I want and that's the sign of God's blessing and prosperity in my life. But that's not in scripture. He never called us to a life of comfortability. In fact, when Jesus was walking with his disciples and he was pouring into them and walking with them, he took them to places they didn't want to go. He said things to them that they didn't want to hear. He asked them to do things that they didn't want to do, that stretched them, that would move them, that would lead them, that would ultimately prepare them. Friends, you've got to realize, as Christians, where we grow most in Jesus, where we become a better disciple is in those places of uncomfortability, where we get uncomfortable, where we get open and we say, God, whatever you want, do it. So how do we break this mold of lukewarmness? How do we as a church get out of this lukewarmness? I'll just give you one thing today. One simple thing. Stop playing it safe. Stop playing it safe. When we say to God, we'll do, we will go wherever you want to go and do whatever you want to do. Let me illustrate this. Could you help me? Can you bring those three chairs up here? Yeah, just grab them. See, I think there's all, for all of us, there's a place in our life where we got in our walk with Jesus. I tried to get a high beam, but it was too expensive. Um, Where we said, you know what, Jesus? I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I will live however way you want me to live. I will follow you. I will serve you. I will pursue you with all that I have. And you said, God, if you want me to give, I'll give. If you want me to help the homeless, I'll help the homeless. If you want me to invite someone into the house, I'll invite someone into the house. And we said, God, whatever you're calling me to do, I'll do it because I love you. You saved me. You redeemed me. You rescued me. I want to live my life for you. Do you remember that day? You remember those moments where Jesus was everything you looked for? And then something happened along the way. Life got hard. Things got difficult. Pain happened. And you're still here. You're still there. Maybe it was a sickness or maybe it was you got blessed and your business grew and you started making money where Jesus became less and less of a priority. Or maybe someone in your home got sick or you had a loss of a loved one and you're like, man, this is hard. And in those moments, you, you were on the high beam, but then you said, you know what? I need a break for a little bit. Help me not to fall, Jesus. And you, and you got there, and you sat. And you said, you know, I need a break for a second. I need to be comfortable for a little bit because, and sometimes that's not a bad thing. Because sometimes 
For some of us, taking a break is actually a good thing because what we do becomes our identity instead of Jesus becoming our identity. And for some of us, it was, man, I have some doubts about my faith, and I need to pause for a second to figure this out. And we sit. And we, and we get off the ledge, and we get sit here. And that's, sometimes that's actually a really, really good thing. But the problem is, days become weeks. Weeks become year, and then it's two years, and then it's three years, and it's four years. And pretty soon you realize, you know, it's actually pretty comfortable here. This chair is pretty nice. It's, it's less risky here. It's a lot more riskier to stand knowing one bad move I could fall over, top over, and it'll be on YouTube and everyone will laugh at me for the rest of my life. Um, but it's a lot safer to sit right here. And we move from, God, I'll do anything for you. And then our prayers start to shift and say, God, I just want to be here. Protect me. Bless my family. Protect my family. Bless my kids. Keep me here. Keep me comfortable. I like it here, Jesus. Don't make me do anything. I'll still pray to you. I'll still give a little bit, but oh, it's so much easier right here. And we pray. Don't give me any trouble. God, don't give me any hardships. God, don't put trials in my life because this is so much more comfortable. And then we'll get older in life. We'll say, God, um, I want to die a peaceful death. Don't make me suffer. Help me die in my sleep. Help me to die with my family around you. I don't want to make any risk when I'm older. Just let me linger here. And we stand before Jesus after our death. And we're like, yay, God made it. And Jesus looks at us and says, you played it safe. You had so much potential. You had so many ways that you could have made an impact for me. You had so many things you could have done so that others would know me, but you were so interested in just holding on to your seat that you missed it. A prayer that I have been convicted with lately and I'd love to present it to you as well. I know we're way over our time, whoever's watching time. Um, but if God answered every one of my prayers today, would it make any difference outside of my life and my family's life? If the prayers that I'm praying today, if all it impacted was my life, my blessings, my safety, my security, my family, and if that's all the extent of my prayers was, friends, I think we're playing it safe. At that point, I think we're just lukewarm. Because yes, we'll show up, but man, I, I don't want to take risks for Jesus. I don't want to invite someone into my house who might be a hard conversation. I don't want to uh, go through experiences where I could get hurt or be in pain. I don't want to do any of that. So, so I'm just going to pray safe prayers. I'm going to live a safe life. I'm going to do safe things. And we get to the point where we think, man, it's so much easier to be comfortable for Jesus because it feels better here. I don't know about you, but a prayer for my life is that when I breathe my last breath here on earth and I see Jesus, I want the devil and his legions to throw a party because I want them to say, man, thank God he's gone. I want to live my life in such a way that Jesus is honored and the devil hates it. What about you? What about us? (laughs) 
I want to live where I stand before my Savior and he could say, truly say, well done. I don't want to get to the point where he says, you took the easy road. You lived a life of comfort. You didn't take risks. I gave my life for you, but you chose to, you know, just go through the motions. I don't want that in my life. And friends, as your pastor, I don't want Jesus to say that for you. I want every one of you to live your lives in such a way where, and I am in love with Jesus, that he will look down on me and say, well done. Heart check. I think there's a reason why Jesus put this letter last. Because I think this is the hardest of all the letters. Because this hits home for all of us. Heart check. So the only way I can do that is the recognition that my life has been bought with the blood of Jesus. That it is no longer mine. It's his. And so if it is his... When he says go, I'll go. When he says give, I'll give. When he says do, I'll do. Because it's not my life anymore. It's his. So so the question is, where do you want to live? Or the better question is, is it your life or is it his life? Is it your life? Or is it his life? Pray with me. Worship team, come. Before we go to communion, I'm going to invite you to Spend some time with Jesus. I know this message was hard for me to prepare. And I had to spend quite a bit of time in, G- in front of Jesus asking, man, I can't preach this if I don't live this. And so as we, before we go to communion, I want to invite you to spend a little bit of time with Jesus. Jesus, am I living lukewarm? Is my prayers only for myself and my family? Am I taking risks for the gospel? Am I living my life in such a way where it's God? I don't know if I will fall or not, but if you're calling me to do it, I will absolutely do it. I just want to live for you. And so what I want to do, I want to pray. I know normally we take communion together, but the worship team is going to be singing. I want to invite you, as you pray and spend some time with Jesus, would you, um, whenever you're ready, as you spend time with him, take communion on your own, and then whenever you're ready, stand and we'll sing together. Lord Jesus, as we come to you, Father, it's my prayer for this church body, that you would, that we would be of value to you, that we wouldn't simply be comfortable, that we wouldn't simply go through the motions, but our hearts would be on fire for Jesus. And Holy Spirit, would you convict us today? Would you draw us back to you? Would you help us to put our faith, our trust in you? We love you in Jesus' name.